take your head tuck in. Then we're going to pass it. Then we're going to go to lunch. Or you can lunch and then go to practice, whatever. Uh, and then we're going to come back here at 12.30 for blood pressure and atrial pulse. You guys have the benefit because you learned about pulses on Wednesday, so hopefully it's going to flow right into atrial pulses and blood pressure. Okay? Um, we're being recorded today. Uh, this is our uh, Echo 360. Uh, it's called Lexa Cap Capture on your Blackboard tools. So uh, once we record this morning and upload them this afternoon, you'll be able to review these skills um, on your Blackboard class. You know, because it, it's a lot to learn. Remember, it's like driving a car. Remember, I'm telling you to adjust the mirror, adjust the seat, adjust, turn the radio off, turn the and it's just too much at first, right? So um, just, you know, absorb some of it, review the tape, practice it. Uh, the students were in practicing yesterday and they, they sprayed strides in a couple hours, so um, it, it works out really well that way. Okay. Um, I also want to uh, remember I'm teaching you the Delaware Tech Owens campus policy and procedure. So we have put, you know, we try to find videos that are very similar to what we do. Um, and like I said, when you're practicing, or even in home health, home health is completely different than what I'm teaching you today. We're doing hospital-based take care and take suction, where all the germs are, where all the scary germs are, so we're doing it as sterile as possible. All right? Um, so um, I saw there was some discussion about the way I demonstrated is different than the video, and that would be the video from the other campus. Okay? So make sure that the way I demonstrated today and the way it's videotaped is how you'll be evaluated on the skill. Okay? Because this is based on evidence-based practice and it's the safest and best way for you to perform your skill, especially when you're learning it. Alright? Any questions about that? Is there any more discussion about it overnight? Okay. Um, so I think we're ready to start then. Um, this is take two for videos, so we're trying a couple different, we're trying a couple different things, so if Ms. Wheeler, when you look at it on, and these don't turn out, and Ms. Wheeler has a different outfit on, it's because it was the class that were recorded on Monday. <laughs> So, but I will say, if you if that ends up happening, the sound from Monday was very right. low. You really have to crank everything up you have for sound, and you don't want to be trying to do it while your kids are running around watching TV. We're trying to get better sound. Today. So we're trying to get better sound. But we might mess up something. Else. Never, we'll never, never know. know. Yeah, we're not sure where the camera is today. Like it's well, take three. Well, we're doing we have three cameras. We have three cameras, one of which is over there to the mannequin, our little GoPro, and we don't know what we're recording because it goes on there three parts. So we'll find out after class. So we <laughs> like take all of this and then put it together. That's the best way. We yeah. hope so. <laughs> we're trying. And I have two directors here, so if I'm distracted or say something <laughs> left and I mean right, please raise your hand and say, Miss Wheeler, what what did you say? Please, you know, stop she basically me. wanders out of the picture. Or if we go like this, she needs to put her stuff down so that it's up on the cam up there on the screen. So I'm very distracted. So are you nervous? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. A little, a little bit. In other words, we don't scare her in the front <laughs> <laughs> What? You can watch right there. And I'm recording I'm recording right there. Okay, Oh, uh, your questions are fine. So, with questions, I might restate it so that it gets on the mic. So, um, you know, don't worry about, you know, being recorded yourself because it really adds to it. Okay? All right. So, um, let me check that out. Are you recording? Mm -hmm. And yeah. when I'll do the camera round, you do the hip piece really quick. Yeah, what are you, what, what do you want me to focus on? Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I, um, the problem is, is I move around a lot. <laughs> I know, and I have to say, change over here <laughs> and not in there. And so I'm trying to, but I can see on their faces that it's that's like, like before there was temple. All right, I'm ready. Let's talk about everybody's stuff this way. All right, so how you pack it. Um, I like your uh, Pearson Shields book. I was able to review it this week. The shields are beautiful, probably the best I've seen. So, um, and then I forgot to bring my shields book home. So I had to use the link that Mrs. Fleetwood posted. Thank you very much. And I was able to go online through the Blackboard class and look at your Taylor Shields book. So I updated your sheet to put the, where the shields are, but I didn't print those out for you. I'm going to tell you where they are. But anyway, we're just going to start with just a brief review of anatomy and physiology. So you remember um, how it normally is supposed to go. We're going to have a patient with a tracheostomy today, and so things are differently. So the motion care of a patient with a tracheostomy um, is going to be different than normal anatomy and physiology. So let's just talk about the upper airways for a minute. Okay, we're talking about the, um, the uh, sinuses, orthopharynx and things like that. What is the purpose of that for respiratory, the respiratory system? Why do we have the upper airway? The air comes in, and then what happens to the air? It's warm, it filters it out, and what else? It dehumidifies it, very good. So those are the three purposes of the upper airway. So if we bypass that with a patient, our nursing care is going to be focused on providing those three things for our patient. We're going to have to humidify our oxygen. We're going to have to make sure it's completely clean or sterile because the patient doesn't have the benefit of filtering it out. And we're also sometimes going to warm it if the patient's sensitive to that. Okay? Uh, so uh, we also have the larynx there, which is also known as the voice box. So if a patient has a trach, they're not able to speak, typically, all right? So we're going to have to adjust our nursing care a little bit differently for patients that can't speak. They can't call for help. They can't tell us what their name and date of birth is, right? So we have to think of alternative ways to communicate with them. Um, then we have the epiglottis. The epiglottis protects our patient's airway. Because they lose some of that, they shouldn't be lying flat. Typically, you're going to find take patients are sitting up at all times to protect uh, some things going from the esophagus into the lungs. Okay, so we're losing that protective. Um, the other thing that we need to talk about is position. And the next skill that I'm going to talk to you about is NG tube. I teach the tube, tube, tube flexor. So if you position your patient properly, you're going to get the tube in the right place. Because today we're putting the tube in the um, trachea. Next week, we're going to be putting the tube in the esophagus. So if you position your patient properly, the tube's going to go in the right place. Because the GI tract is dirty, right? Unfortunately, it's right next to the airway, which is sterile. So if we position our patient this way, what do you think we're doing? What is that position? Remember when you do CPR, that's how you open the airway, you extend the head. So that's how our patient's going to need to be to get the trach tube in. When we put the NG tube down in the gastric, how do we protect the airway with swallowing? Hand tucked. So that's how we're going to position our patient for the NG tube. Open airway, hand tucked with swallowing. Okay, it's, that's basic, but it's very important for our patient. Make sure the tube goes in the right place. Um, so then we get down to the carina. What do you know about the carina? It bifurcates, very good. It opens left and the right. What else? I'm sorry? Smaller and higher in children. Yes, it can be in a different position in children, that's right. Increased that contain cough receptors. Cough receptors, that's very important. We're going to be putting a tube into our patient's trachea, and when it hits the carina, I want you all to say carina, because we're going to talk about the carina. Carina. It rhymes with the carina. <laughs> 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 
won't forget it, right? Right. Sure enough, somebody this week said Karina. It's Karina. Okay. So when our tube goes in and hits the Karina, the patient's going to cough. And they're going to cough violently, which is okay, because that's why we're ultimately suction the patient anyway. All right. So the tube goes in, hits those very sensitive cough receptors, the patient's going to cough. Okay. So you know where the tube is when you hit that spot. And you have to be prepared for it because the patient's literally almost come up off the bed a little bit. All right? And then we have the left bronchus and the right bronchus. The right lung has how many lung fields or lung lobes? Three. Three. Very good. And the left has two. two. Which bronchus is narrower? The left. Very good. So which bronchus is wider? Three. The right. So if a patient perhaps aspirates, Maybe I choked on my thumb. Which lung do you think that might go in? Yeah. The right. So when you're listening to breath sounds and your patient might have aspirated, where do you think it's going to hear changes first? Yeah. In the right. Okay? So all that anatomy physiology is very important. And I said it this week when we were talking about pulses and they're trying to pulse. I'm like, where are the arteries under here? The arteries not in the middle, right? So you have to think about the physiology underneath the skin to figure out where you're putting your tube and where you're going to find your pulse. So it all ties together. That's why it's a prerequisite. Okay. Um, so let's talk about airway suctioning. This is still number 1318 in your book on page 442. And the reason we suction our patients is like I mentioned before, they cannot cough their secretions out. They're in respiratory distress. So we're going to suction them to get their secretions out. So it's removal of secretions. It might just be upper airway. It might be lower airway. We're going to use a plastic catheter that's in your kit. Okay, we're going to use this plastic catheter. And it's for only for patients that can not clear their own airways. We would never do this if somebody's coughing effectively. And why do you think that? We could hurt them, right? Our goal is to help our patients, not to hurt them. How could we hurt them? introduce organisms, okay? So this is only for patients that need our assistance. If, that, if that's the case, we need a prescriber's order. Okay, we can't just willy-nilly decide to suction somebody. There should be an order for that because we could potentially harm our patient and then it's the recovery of that order. Okay. Um, there is the instance, though, that sometimes the patient might come with a trach. You know, the podiatrist is worried about our foot surgery, kind of forgets about the stuff associated with the trach. But we, as nurses, are protected because there would be a standing order. We can actually suction the trach without an order, okay, um, and we're standing procedure. So let's talk about the different types of suction. And I listed all five of them there for you. Oropharyngeal, nasopharyngeal, nasotracheal, endotracheal, and trach suction. So we're going to be doing number five today. Oropharyngeal is just like um, going to the dentist. He's cleaning out the secretions, cleaning out the saliva in the upper airway. Okay. Nasopharyngeal, sometimes they do that in the post-anesthesia care unit. The patient has some trouble opening their airway, they got some mucus, maybe they have a sinus problem, they got some drainage. We might just go in the upper airway and clean that out. Okay. Nasotracheal, they go in through the nose and into the trach. So that would need to be a sterile procedure because we're going to the tracheal. When we talk about the upper airway, it's a clean procedure. Okay. So um, let's say uh, you have an aide with you. Okay. What do you think the aide can do? They can do oral pharyngeal suction. Can they do nasotracheal suction? No. Can they do tracheal suction? No. Okay. Because that is a sterile technique, and your book explains it beautifully. I love it. There is a trained set of skills and knowledge that goes into trach suction that nurses have acquired or LPNs. Okay? So that's why we can delegate some things and other things are left to those that supposedly think about the anatomy and physiology, what the patient, how the patient's going to respond, and things like that. Okay? So that's the delegation piece as, as nurses. So, um, and the tracheal suction. Now, some patients you might have seen. Like if you watch ER or any of those medical shows, you don't even know if there's anyone on anymore. Right. 
great to have you join. Um, this is called an endotracheal tube. A patient on a ventilator, or respirator, but that's not really a good word, might be breathing through a breathing tube. Okay, so this would go in the mouth, it's put in by an anesthesiologist or a surgeon, comes out, patient can't talk, and this is the endotracheal tube. Okay, so if they need to be suctioned, they would use this suction device in line, put the tube down, um, suction out their secretions, and pull the suction catheter out. This is the endotracheal tube. Okay? So does their valve go inside? Yes. Um, this actually, this plastic covering, keeps the catheter sterile because these patients usually have a lot of secretions and they need to be suctioned a lot. So rather than opening the whole kit, putting everything up, it's all self-contained in here and the catheter actually goes in like this into the patient. <laughs> Except they can't hear. I mean, you can't, um, they can't speak their butt. <laughs> <laughs> you pop <laughs> <laughs> something and like you, you turn the scat to her. <laughs> like you would cut that section. <laughs> okay, so that's inline suction. And I think I talked about that um, on your paper somewhere. All right. So we're going to learn about tracheal suction today through a tracheostomy, and we're going to talk about care of the trachea in a little bit. All right. Um, <coughs> this suction catheter is a yang power or tonsillar suction catheter. It's kind of very similar to what the dentist used. It's rigid. Okay. We can suction our patient's upper airway and sometimes nares with this catheter. Okay. Um, Usually I leave a protective sleeve here because this is good for 24 hours. Um, you're going to get in the habit of DPI, daytime initials. So I put t um, today's date on here, and this is good for 24 hours. And typically you'll find this like under the patient's pillow or close by, because uh, if they have trouble managing their secretions, you can just suction it out with this. Now who can do this? Who can use this? A nurse? Family members can do it? That's right. So if this gets attached to here, anytime I, I prep the suction catheter, I would have clean gloves on because I'm protecting myself. And then I would just uh, simply clear out my patient's uh, airway if they vomited or um, something like that. So I just go inside here, clean out around the teeth, clean the back of the throat, the equinoxes, cause them to gag. So that's something that you need to do if your CNA is actually doing this oropharyngeal suction. You want to make sure this is teaching about the gag reflex, and you're going to learn that with the suction, because you want to make sure that your CNA doesn't gag the patient, because then they would vomit, and then you've got more of a problem. Okay. Um, and then you actually can uh, suction out the nerve too, in case you have size problems. So this usually scrapes around, called a yank power. They have different sizes, and the different sizes go by French. This is a 14 French catheter. Does it up here. You have to select which size catheter you need for your patient's trach. Um, you don't want to occlude the trach more than 50% of the diameter with the suction catheter. So if a patient has a size 8 trach, and we're going to talk about this when we talk about the trach, you double that 16. 16 would be the largest size catheter you can use. Okay. So with the 14 French, how big does my trach have to be? Seven. Okay, the trach would be a seven. Trachs are usually single number six, seven, eight. Okay. Um, you, you use the smallest size that you need, but you don't want to occlude the airway more than 50%. So let's talk about how we're going to get those secretions out. We have to apply suction. 
and you have to be able to use your suction equipment to be able to get those secretions out. So uh, most hospitals and facilities have what's called a wall unit or head wall, piped in oxygen and suction. Lots of home health care agencies and long-term care facilities have portable suction. And I have portable suction over there, and I'm going to use that today for my demonstration. Because this head wall doesn't work. Um, so I'm going to use portable suction. And um, let me talk about the wall suction first. You have to be able to uh, turn the regulator on and adjust the suction when you use it. You want to make sure all this equipment is ready to go. If you have a patient on seizure precautions or at risk for vomiting, having suction ready is important. Because you don't want your patient to vomit and then you have to leave to go get the equipment. All right, it should always be ready to go. So uh, first thing, uh, all the regulators look a little bit different. Just like looking at your speedometer. You have to figure out how much each line is worth, okay? And um, they all look different. There's also different ways to adjust them. The first thing you have to do is turn it on. So with this one, it's pretty easy. It says off and on. And then you adjust the suction. We're going to talk about that. This one's a little bit different. This is also used for patients that are connected to an NGT. And rather than getting continuous suction, they get what's called intermittent or INT suction. When we're suctioning a patient's trach, we're going to do regular or continuous suctioning. Okay. So that would be off, and this would be continuous. This is what we're going to use. Okay. And then you would adjust this dial, and each of the dials go differently. It tells you more suction is to the right. This one, more suction is to the left. So you have to know how to adjust it. Um, we have three different suction regulators in the lab. This is the third one. This one's easy. It says off and continuous. And then it's got the dials there. So I'm going to pass these around so that you can take a look and see what they look like and how they're different. And um, how to turn them on. So you have to be able to turn it on and adjust it. Okay. So that's the regulator. The other part is the canister. In order to suction your patient effectively, you have to have a closed system. If any of these ports are opened up here, you're not going to create suction for your patient. Part of the age responsibility, or the nurse is going to make sure it gets done, this needs to be empty every 24 hours. Sometimes it's measured, but for suctioning it's not because we're going to be um, sucking up some saline. So a lot of these are different. It would even say to patient, it says patient here for suction. This would be the port to empty it out. Some of them have disposable liners to just take it out and throw it in the trash. So again, you have to be familiar with your canister. Uh, in home health, they get disinfected like every 30 days. In the hospital, they get emptied every day. Um, and if they get too full, you won't be able to create a good suction. So I was checking, I was in the lab this morning, I was checking to make sure they weren't too full to make sure that when you got a track, they're, they're going to work for you. So let's talk about the setting. Uh, for the most part, we're going to be talking about adult patients. And on the portable machine, it only gets set to 10 to 15. On the wall machine, it's going to be set 120 to 150. 150 is a little bit high, and I actually like that the book says 80 to 120, because that's probably a safer range. So 120 is average, all right? And when you turn your suction on, you're going to check your suction by adjusting the knob and uh, creating a closed system, which I'm going to talk about when I go over to the other side and show it to you on the machine. So you have to make sure your canister, everything is closed or else it won't work, um, and ready to go. So let's talk about the actual trach suctioning procedure. And that is on page five in your packet. <coughs> now, the way I like to um, show you how to do procedures, you know, for me, it makes sense. You know, you can tell me something, 
but if I don't understand it or know why you're doing it, it doesn't make sense to me. So when I give you the whole procedure, I give you the rationale, and that's what um, nurses talk about. Why do we do what we do? Well, this is why. So on page five, this is what we do, and then we explain why we do what we do, okay? That also helps us when we're teaching our patients. In the back of your packet is a checklist, which will help you go point by point, but it doesn't necessarily, like it might just say, gather your supplies. If you don't know what your supplies are, you have to look at the rationale, okay? So there is a checklist in the back, but don't go just by that because there's more as a nurse that you need to know than just the checklist, okay? So uh, I'm gonna go through uh, the actual skill, since I'm ready. Let me move this out of the way.
to uh, help you cough, and it's going to help you get the secretions out. It's not really painful, uh, but it is going to give you a good cough. And then safety at all times. So I cannot leave the bedside with the bed up or the rail down. Okay? If I have to go around there to adjust the suction, I'm going to put the side rail up. Okay? I don't necessarily have to put the bed down because I'm not leaving the bed. Right? If I walk away from the bed, I have to put my bed down. So those are the safety principles we're looking for. Okay? So um, to determine if my patient needs to do suction, what kinds of things would you be looking for? Difficulty breathing. Now, is that the patient saying I'm short of breath? How would I? A gurgling. Okay, I might hear some. You guys heard about breath sounds yesterday? What would be what would be a, a breath sound that a patient might need suction? Ears closed. Bronchi. What is bronchi? Rumbling. So if you have mucus in your large airways, that would create the rumbling or the bronchi. Okay. Sometimes if people have aspirated something, the um, bronchial constrict cause bronchospasm. Okay. So you might have some wheezing. So you notice a change in your patient's condition that they need to do suction to get the mucus out. What other kinds of assessments do we need to do before we do air any intervention? See, I'm always using the nursing process. Right? I assess my patients first, ASS, protective airway, priority, right? I'm going to do something, I'm going to reassess and evaluate what my action should be, my intervention. Yes, Dustin? Listen to the lungs. Very good. I would listen to the lung field. Very good. Okay? With my morning assessment, I would listen six anteriorly, two to the side, six posteriorly. But my patient needs to do suction. So I'm not going to listen to 12 lung fields. I've listened, I've heard some bronchi, I'm just going to go, because the upper airways are up here, right? I'm going to listen, he's got bronchi, he needs to do suction. What else are we going to assess besides lung sounds? Pulse ox, very good. So I happen to have a pulse ox here. All patients should have a pulse ox, whether it's continuous or you're spot checking it. You can order for a walk of medicine. facilities, you may or may not have pulse ox. There might be one for the whole unit. I think they sell them in drug stores now, too. So <laughs> patients do have their own pulse ox. Um, and we only have three here, and we have you know about 12 patients. So one student brought in closed pins one year so that she would remember to put the pulse ox on the patient. So I found color-coded ones.
I was okay for you to call, so I needed to see this, and that's good. They actually use all their muscles and all that physiology to go ahead and do that, okay? Which is way more effective than me putting a suit on, okay? Um, then I need to gather my supplies. I need my sterile suction and catheter kit, and I'm gonna need a bottle of normal serum solution, NSX, you guys have them in your lab bag, okay? I'm gonna need my plug. Anytime that I touch any suction catheters, I need gloves. So I'm just gonna bring a couple over there. Now, I've already set my patient up. Um, I like to keep my patients nice, smooth, and clean. Patients that have a trach have a lot of copious amount of secretion. Their gowns will be wet, they'll be wet from the humidification. So I always put a towel here or a chest pad to keep their patient's gown clean. Um, now he's going to possibly get stuck to it, you know, to get that mucus out. And it could go flying anywhere. So it's good to have this. I can just take this off and um, have them cleaned up, okay? I also need personal protective equipment. What kind of things do you think I need to wear? Gowns, Gowns right? Mask. Mask. Goggles, very good. So when you guys do this skill, you're gonna just skate, I would apply my PPE, okay? So I, I have a mask here to protect me from aspirating it. That horrible respiratory virus is going around, so I certainly wanna check that. Um, this has the eye protection, so those things can fly into my eyes. And then a gown to protect my clothing as well, because I can just display there. So that's the appropriate PPE and gloves, of course. Who else does that gown protect besides
try two or three, four times to get the suction done. So before I get started, I'm going to make sure this is all working, my suction working, and I've got it set up perfectly. And I also need a trash can here to throw my supplies away. position my patient. This is a semi-salaried. You might actually need to be in high-salaried position. Um, this is just a, a, a thing with the mannequins. Our mannequins are very skinny. They have a very prominent chin. There's only like an inch between the trach and the chin, which is not usually the case. So I've taken this pillow out. Let's look at the pillow here. Okay. So I've taken this pillow out. I've got him in high-salaried position. He's pulled up nice and high in the bed. So that I can access his trach. Because I'm getting ready to put a sterile catheter in and I can't touch his chin or contaminate it. So he's properly positioned. I have the head of the bed up. I'm at working level. I'm going to go ahead and put my side rail down. Make sure I got my suction catheter ready. Make sure that's full. Um, I've got my equipment ready. I've got my PPE on. So now this is a sterile procedure. Um, we're going to introduce it today, and then we're going to learn more about it next week. But the principles basically for a sterile procedure are we have to keep everything in our view. I can't turn my back like this because I don't know if somebody put something on my chin. Okay? Stays in my view. It has to be uh, above my waist level, but not too high. Okay? All sterile packages are medically sealed and they will have like a little lip to open it with. When I open my package, and I'll show this to you, there is a one inch corner here or a flap that I can open my gloves with. There's a flap here. This is going to be a sterile procedure because I have sterile gloves in here, sterile catheter. I need, this is a little plastic cup here. I can only touch the bottom, so I'm going to slide that out. I'm going to pop it open. I'm going to put it on my tray. I can't touch the inside because that's going to stay sterile. Now, I need to um, fill it up with my saline, so I'm going to put it there. And I'm opening my sterile. It says sterile on it, I think. Uh, I'm going to open my saline bottle and I'm going to pour it in my cup okay. and you can't touch it all right so I need to be a little bit above so I'm going to pour about 100 milliliters of saline in my container okay. if the plastic bag is near the top when you open it don't worry when you start pouring it won't fall into the box I don't know how much 100 milliliters is this marking is on here that bottle here um, so now I'm ready to open my sterile tip. Okay. Uh, another principle of sterile is sterile can touch sterile and non-sterile can touch non-sterile, but they can't cross because they need contaminated materials here. Okay. So everything on the outside is non-sterile. Everything in my package is sterile. Okay. So I'm going to open this up. And my cup is supposed to be at the bottom, so I need to spin my package around because I have to be able to put my gloves on uh, from the bottom. So I'm going to spin my package around like this. Okay. And another principle of sterile technique is I can't reach over my package, okay? Because germs and fromites from my arm, skin cells, um, staph that normally reside in the skin will fall in my sterile field. So I can never reach over. So that's why I spun it like that from the outside. Now, you also notice that my flap closed. Because these are sealed like this, your keys will automatically close everything. So that's a, a tip in a trick you're going to learn is how to keep your flap from staying open. So I can bend that. And I'm going to try to slide it up nicely so that you can see it. Okay. So you have to have a little bit of patience to be able to get that to stay open. The one inch quarter, the 
parts that I use to open is kind of like a transitional border. I can touch that if I have to, but the inside is all sterile. I have my gloves one on top of each other. The thumbs are usually positioned out. So I'm going to put on my left glove first. Now in order to do that, I'm reaching into my sterile field, so I can't touch anything except for the cup of this glove. Um, so I'm only touching the cup. So the first glove I'm going to put on by pinching. Okay? And I'm going to slide my hand in, I'm going to back out over my sterile field because I don't want any of my um, germs to fall on my sterile field. And I'm only touching the cup that's going to be against my skin. And I'm going to slide my glove on. Okay? If any of it is rolled up or I have the fingers in the wrong, I can fix it later. Okay? You know this part is rolled up by the line? That has to stay like that because the outside of the glove that's sterile has rolled in towards your skin. So if she unrolls that, it's all contaminated. So she's best off just to leave it curled up like that. Not going down. all the way under her elbow. You have to do that again. Okay. My next glove, I'm going to keep because that's sterile to sterile. So the first glove is pinch, second glove is keep. So I'm going to scoop into here. And this is, I think, where the question came. When, when she has that second glove down on the paper, she can touch with that gloved hand anything she wants to touch because it's sterile to sterile. So if she puts her thumb, her gloved thumb, on that cup right now, that's fine because it's sterile to sterile. Okay? When she slides her hand into it, if she leaves her gloved thumb there, chances are very good that it's going to hit her bare hand, contaminate it. So while it's all sterile to sterile, you can touch, she can touch whatever she wants inside that package. But when she puts it on, it's best to pull that glove thumb out of the way so she doesn't touch it to her hand. Does that clear up the question? Yeah. Thank you. I thought, that's what it, I thought that's what it was. I thought there's no way I'm going to fix that on Facebook. I'm going to wait until Friday and have it in person. There you go. So I have sterile to sterile. I have my thumb out of the way because this thumb is sterile. I can't touch his hand. So I'm scooping and I'm going to put my fingers in the glove. This is why rings, rings with stones, are not allowed in clinical. Because those stones are made part of the glove. Okay? So that's why for lab purposes, there will be no stones on your glove, on your rings. Okay? Plain bands only. So I think it has no problem. Because you ripped the glove. Okay? So, um, slide my glove in. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try to do this so that unfortunately I don't want to have to move that. Let's say I had my thumb over here. Okay. My thumb is in the pinky hole. All right. Or I have two gloves, two fingers in one hole. Okay. Might happen like this. It's okay. You're going to get good about figuring out how to turn your glove around and how to fix your finger holes when you're sterile. All right. So this is sterile to sterile, so now I can fix all my gloves, I can pull my fingers out, I can twist my glove around if I have to, and like I said before, I make this look very easy because I, it's natural to me. You guys are learning how to do it, so you have to practice it and you have to get good practice for doing glove runs. Yes, Dr. Um, even a normal hot sheet you can pull it, so that down is going to be like right there? Yep. You pull it over it? Or yeah, pull it over it. Okay. Only if you can and still be under the cup. Well, what we're doing because we're not if you're in surgery yes they put their glove way up over their gown to seal to seal it but what we're doing like she couldn't fix that little it's hole like it's, still, it's, still a little bit of it's fine for what we're doing because we're not in the operating room that would be um surgical infection okay uh, which is a little bit different than what we're doing she would know. fly yeah <laughs> Okay, so now that I have my sterile gloves on, I have to keep my hands out of trouble. All right, 
I can't adjust my glasses, I can't fix my hair, and I have to be very mindful of where my gloves are. <laughs> and use all my gloves. Um, lots of times I will interlock my fingers, play with whoever, but I don't pretend with anything. Okay, that helps because if your fingers are nice and secure, if your gloves are too long or too, you're not, you don't have good um, dexterity to do it, still can steal. All right, so I, I'm still sterile. Now I'm going to grab my suction catheter out using sterile technique, okay? We are going to learn and practice about breaking sterile technique, and we're going to talk about this at the end, okay? So right now everything is sterile. So I can grab my package. Um, this is my suction catheter. It has two ends. It has an end for the patient, and this end goes to my suction catheter. And I don't know how much Ms. Kendall can zoom in, but I think she can zoom in pretty well. I want you to look at the uh, tip of the suction catheter. It has markings on it, so I can see how far down I need to go. And there, are, see, can you see the hole going through? Mm -hmm. All right. There's a hole at the end of the catheter, and there's two holes on either side. Okay. So if I put my catheter in like this, I'm only going to get 50% of my tracheal cleaned out. But I can simply roll my catheter between the thumb and the forefinger, and I get a complete 360 cleaning of the tracheal. And that's all I'm doing is rotating it, rolling it between my thumb and forefinger. Can you see that? See how the holes? all the way around, okay? I'm making sure that my suction catheter doesn't touch my clothes, doesn't touch my stethoscope, doesn't touch anything. It's still sterile. Now I have to make a decision. I'm getting ready to contaminate one hand, okay? Um, I'm left-handed, so I'm out on my patient's left side of the bed because I'm going to use my dominant hand to put this tube in. My suction catheter is there by the patient, okay? So I'm going to put this catheter in my left hand, uh, and the other thing that I do so that it doesn't flop around and get contaminated, okay, is I roll it in my hand. I'm going to roll the end that's going to the patient's airway tightly in my hand because I don't want that to get contaminated. So I'm going to roll it around like this, and then I've got good firm pressure for this catheter that I can connect to this one. The other purpose of rolling it in my hand is it actually helps warm and it helps position my tube so it goes down the tracheal. But you see how the natural curvature occurs? See, when I go to my patient, it's going to go right in like that, right where I want it to go. Okay? Um, so I'm going to wrap that back up. And my right hand is getting ready to get contaminated. I'm going to touch my suction catheter, so my right hand is no longer sterile. I'm going to keep my left hand sterile because this is the hand that has the tube that's going in the lungs. So, um, I'm going to push these together, okay, making sure that sterile doesn't touch non-sterile, right? And I'm going to, um, this is the thumb control right here. So I'm going to slide my catheter down, and there is my thumb control right there, right? Before I suction my patient, I have to make sure that my suction works, and I have to do that a couple ways. my suction on so I can show you. And I can use this hand, and I'm not putting my back to my sterile field. I'm and keeping my body in front. And making sure her catheter doesn't touch anything. I'm going to go over here, and if I stick my catheter in my family, nothing happens. I have to make it a closed system by putting my thumb on the thumb hole. Okay? So, a couple things happen. I know my suction works. I've got adequate suction. I've actually lubricated my catheter, so it's going to go into my patient easier and I'm not going to harm them. Okay? movements, making sure that this catheter doesn't get contaminated anywhere, okay? So um, in real life, I would leave the suction on, but for teaching purposes, you can't hear me. All right, now I need to move my patient's oxygen. I see his stats are now down to 92. I've taken so long to test. 
All right, section 92, uh, Paul talks 92. Uh, I need to remove this oxygen. This is the oxygen mask or a trach mask. Okay, so I'm gonna move that to the side so that I can access this trach with oxygen to remove it again. I need some resistance, I could twist it to get it past the trach because sometimes it gets hung up on the trach. That's right there, okay. I'm going to insert my catheter until I meet resistance, and that's actually at 27. Where am I? Why would I need be needing resistance? Right. Everybody say it together. That bifurcation. I've met resistance. My patient's going to start coughing. <laughs> okay. I'm going to pull my catheter out about an inch or a centimeter. This is centimeter. Okay. So I'm going to pull it out to 24. I'm now going to apply my suction. Put my thumb on. I'm going to twist and pull my catheter out 10, 15 seconds. So I'm twisting, twisting, working my hand down, twisting. Okay. And I'm going to give him his oxygen back. Not only was he low in oxygen before, now I've sucked more air out of him. He's coughed, he needs oxygen. All right, so I'm going to put his oxygen back. He's got to now 90%. Okay. While he's recuperating, catching his breath, I'm going to watch his pulse up. He might still be coughing, which is good. Okay. Uh, I can look at these secretions, I can assess the secretions. Could be yellow, blood tinge, black, brown, okay. green. I can, I need to see it at my catheter because I don't want to introduce anything in here back into his trachea. So I'm going to take my catheter out, keep an eye on my patient, determine how thick it is, okay, how thick it is to see how hard it goes down the um, tubing. Okay. So I'm waiting. Um, that was good, Mrs. Brainbreaker. I'm going to go down one more time because I see you're still having some trouble and I got a good bit, good bit out. Fast up to 93 already. So you want to wait at least a minute between suction passage. Okay. Then you have to use your nursing judgment skills. Do I need to go down again? Or did I get it the first time? Or the third time? I'm keeping this. You know, I can let that go as long as it, um, the catheter doesn't touch anything. So I'm going to go a second time. I'm going to move my patient mask. I'm going to insert the catheter. I don't touch anything on the way in. Inserting, inserting. That resistance, I picked up. He's coughing. I'm going to pull out about an inch. Okay, I can't see that. Pull out about, I'm going to apply my suction. I can only apply suction on the way out. I can never apply suction when I'm going in. I'm going to apply my suction and I'm going to twist my catheter. Now I have to be careful because I felt my catheter was touching my arm there. See that? So I need to make sure that I've got my hand so that only the rough part, suction, coughing, turning, suction, coughing, turning. <laughs> All right, 93%, good. You must have got a lot of it the first time. All right, again, I'm gonna take my catheter out while he's catching his breath, okay? I'm gonna talk to you a little bit while he's catching his breath. I can either apply continuous suction, keeping my thumb on here the whole time, no more than 10 to 15 seconds, or I can use intermittent suction. It doesn't matter, okay? Either continuous or intermittent is fine. Um, I think I got it with two. I don't hear that uh, rumbling anymore. He's fast for 97% already. Wow, I'm glad I came and assessed you when I did. Okay, seems like you're doing pretty well. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of my catheter. And I'm going to do it in the most clean, effective way. How do you think I should get rid of my catheter? In my glove. I'm going to put it in my glove. Okay, because I don't want this thing flopping around. So again, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to wrap it around my hand. Okay. I'm going to pull this apart. Put my suction there. I'm 
I'm going to take it off in my glove. So I'm going to pull my glove up over my catheter. So this sort of is all self-contained and enclosed in this glove. I'll cut down germs in the hospital. Okay. And then I'm going to put my second glove inside. And then I'm going to dispose of all of my equipment in the trash can in the real world. Well, you're taking the gloves off with your hand that you took the glove off actually touches what what you have in your hand, even though you're done. Mm -hmm. I know it's, you don't want to do that, but is that okay? Are you talking about, are you worried about breaking the scale? Yeah, okay. even yeah. though you're done. I'm all done because if I have to go in again, I would have to get another. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Have you have any of those children and teens and their dad with you? Yes. Um, we'll talk about that. Okay. Um, I'm not asking you just in general. Okay. Right.
they might feel an irregular pulse or the blood pressure goes up or the blood pressure goes down. So that's another complication. A uh, laryngospasm. What does laryngospasm sound like? Spasm of the larynx. It's a high pitched like a slider. Okay. So you put that soothing the patient and that develops that condition was caused by you putting the soothing. So you can't do that anymore. Okay, that would be a medical emergency. We have to call a rapid response team and get some assistance. Bronchospasm. What does bronchospasm sound like? Dilators, some respiratory therapists where they prescribe it. Sometimes you might not get any secretion, so you need to do some troubleshooting. Is it because it's supposed to be hydrated and dry? Did you need more fluid? Was this bottle dry? So this bottle went out overnight and now I'm not getting any secretion. Um, introduction of infectious organisms. That's why we're sticklers about stale technique. We don't want to harm our patients by giving them an infection. Um, our patient actually might get worse. We think that we're doing something beneficial, but they needed that little extra oxygen, and now they're starting to um, decline. Okay, so we don't want them to uh, worsen. We might have to limit the amount of suction, um, maybe only suction once instead of twice. Maybe get an assistant to help provide oxygen while I'm suctioning, right? Because this is a stale procedure. Um, and be prepared for trach emergencies. And we're going to talk about uh, trach care when we get back from break. Any other questions about trach suctioning? Yes? Um, will we actually go to perform the laxial? How many times would you not want to do that? It depends. That's my favorite answer. It depends. <laughs> we might have you do it once. We might have you do it twice. Or if we're not quite sure if we know what you're doing, we might have you do it three times. Okay. So it'll depend. Okay. We'll, we'll let you know what the patient pulse ox is doing and what oh. your patient so looks like. Right. together what you're doing and why. So you might remember.